Ironside will not be seen tonight, so we may bring you the following special program. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. I'm trying to both bring something that might be new in terms of extra grit, detail, what have you, but keep to the parameters, the shapes as defined by Kirby and Sinnott. Uh, in particular, when I'm drawing the thing for this particular project, I was looking not just back at Jack's work, um, I'm looking back at John Buscema's artwork in particular because Buscema had an amazing fluidity. So I, I specifically studied his work and tried to emulate some of his shots just to build off of him as an influence because I, I feel like I know so much about what Kirby did and I want to build from that to something else that um, is ultimately getting to the soul of the character to some degree. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. Happy to welcome Paul Kupperberg back. Always good to talk to Paul about a new book project, and he's got a, a new Kickstarter underway. I want to I want to show the cover, Paul, because uh, it'll open the discussion quite nicely. Excellent. And there it is. Direct creativity on the heels of direct conversations and direct. Was the first book direct currents? The first one was direct currents. Yeah. Yeah. These are amazing, and uh, God, I am I am really excited to talk to you. Uh, some classic creators, some current creators as well. And uh, so, what is the thrust of this book compared to the others? Well, uh, this is uh, really just talking about the the creative, you know, uh, not even the creative process, but really what what inspired uh, 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 and and uh, you know provoked creativity in all these different people you know what what did they read what movies what comic books what tv shows uh the books you know it's just um it's it's all over you know there there's there's all the uh you know and i spoke to me like you know i roy thomas who you know and kind of like as i'm just before i got on on with roy and i realized you know roy grew up in the era of radio like he didn't have television, like you know we did, and so I'm talking to, to those guys, to guys like him, and I'm talking to to you know uh, uh, newer creators like Tom King and and Mark Guggenheim, who are you know more recent to the business. Um, even though you know, like like after 20 years, it's like yeah, you're still a newcomer, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. There, well, they're part of uh, this current era, so I, yeah. I, I, I could appreciate that distinction. Yeah. I'm gonna throw up a picture. You have on your Facebook feed. Look at that, yeah. everybody. So uh, let's see. I want to. I want to see if I get everybody right. Uh, Jerry Conway, Chuck Patton, Mindy Newell, uh, Mike Oming, Tom King, Mike DiCarlo, Dan DiDio, uh, Rick Stasi, uh, J.M. DiMatteis, Joe Illich, uh, Christopher Priest. Uh, Who is that? Uh, Barbara Calberg. Barbara Calberg, and then. DJ Chester and Mike Collins, Mark Miller, Mark Guggenheim, Roy Thomas, and Mark Wade. That's a hell of a group, man. Yeah. Yeah. I got, uh, you know, I, I, I just started making, uh, you know, sending out emails and requests and, and just about everybody was, was, was okay about talking with me and, and, you know, uh, had a lot of really fun conversations. I'm just, uh, working on editing, uh, uh, the one I had with with Mark Demattis, and it's like it's it's really you know a lot of great stuff in it. I, I you know while you're talking, you you know well you know how it goes. You're you're talking and it's just a conversation, and then later you go back and you realize wow there was some gold in there that you didn't quite realize at the time. So um, um, it's been a lot of fun, and you know it also gives me an opportunity to you know to to get uh, to talk to to old friends and and. Uh, and meet people I haven't had a chance to talk to. So, uh, you know, like, oh, I get to talk to Roy Thomas for an hour and a half. Okay. 
I can do that. <laughs> no, I hear you, man. Absolutely. And um, again, it's a good mix of old and new as far as creators goes. Um, were these live Zoom conversations? You yeah. know, I always laugh at the um, and and forgive me because it was done for a really long time, I suppose. But people, I know that people would write articles, interview articles, and essentially back in the day, send a questionnaire yeah. to a yeah. to a creator. And I know that was commonplace. But by, by the digital age, I, I know when I started Word Balloon, I, I would talk to friends that were creators, and I'm like. Uh, I don't know, man. And again, I, I was coming as a new guy, but I'm like, uh, they were they were also young, younger writers as well. And I'm just like, uh, what do you got to do their homework for them? I'm like, how about how about calling the person and taking notes yeah. or you know recording a Skype call or a Zoom call, you know, whatever, or even a telephone call. <laughs> yeah, did you ever, Paul? Did you ever have the little suction cup that you'd put on uh, the earpiece? Oh, hell of yeah. your yeah. Uh, on, uh, on, on direct currents, uh, you know, I was doing these interviews in, in you know, 19, late, 18, 19, late 1880s, the late 1980s and early 1990s. And, uh, you know, that was it. You got on the telephone. I got my little suction cup, uh, you know, micro cassette recorder. And, yeah. uh, and then I, I spent the next two days transcribing these things. Yeah. Um, now, of course, the transcription is a lot easier. You just... You know, you, you send it through a, a transcription uh, service uh, online and, you know, but you still have to, it still requires a lot of editing because first sure. of all, if you take a transcription of most people's conversations, they're not publishable. <laughs> they, they require a lot of work. So, yeah. uh, you know, um, but, um, but yeah, it's, I, I can't tell you how many, how many interviews I gave, you know, and I'm writing it. You know, I'm writing the answers for this guy, for these people. Yeah. You know, uh, but yeah, <laughs> it, well, looking back, it was like, you know what, call me and, and you do it. I have work to do, you know, but. Well, and it's funny because you and I were talking off the air. There was, I, I don't even know the name of the podcast and I won't name them to shame them, mm -hmm. but somebody pro approached Bob Greenberger about doing an interview and he didn't really read the full uh, details. And among them was, well, you'll be paying the podcaster $30 for the privilege yeah. of being interviewed. The privilege, yeah. if you will. And it's yeah. just like, man, I, I and, like who and, you and, think you are. And Bob wrote back saying, no, you don't understand. The money flows to the creatives, <laughs> not from the creatives. And, uh, you know, and, and the guy uh, responded, you know, he, he couldn't believe Bob's arrogance. <laughs> So, <laughs> like uh, Greta, the, the the kid worried about the environment from the Netherlands. How dare you? How, How dare, dare you? you? Yeah. <laughs> I am a legitimate scam. How could you possibly? So. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, Paul, I've been doing this 19 years, and um, yeah, uh, I, that's oh, by the that's way, the checks in the mail. So. I was gonna say, man, exactly. Well, that's uh, like a lot of us, Art and Franco, and I were talking, and it's like, I think somebody owes us a lot of money. <laughs> Yeah, really. Yeah. That's for sure. Forget about it. Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean, you know, whatever. It is what it is. Um, but the good news is uh, I'm excited to see these conversations because, again, going back to your uh, your first couple books, like uh, Direct Currents and Direct Conversations, um, they've all been great. They've all been knowledgeable. And they've, they've really – they do – you know, you're doing what I do, man, but I just do it on audio because I'm lazy. You know, <laughs> oh, believe you know? me, anything to avoid a Kickstarter campaign. So, yeah. how's it going? It's going well. It's going well. We, we were funded in the first, uh, you know, a couple of days, and uh, you know, so now it's just uh, a matter of waiting it out. I think it, there's uh, uh, 15 or 16 more days to go, so you know, plenty of time, people. <laughs> Jump in, everybody. I think it's a worthy uh, Kickstarter campaign. And I would imagine, again, because you've done so many in the recent past, that I'm sure you're cultivating a Kickstarter community of, of return buys, I hope. I guess. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I do Can recognize a lot of the names, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, it's, uh, um, you know, there, there are, well, you know, people who know, know and, and come back for more. Uh, sure. The, the trick is getting more people to know, so. No, I understand. Um, again, I, here I want to I want to put the photo up again to ask you about some specific people and stuff. Sure. 
Now, uh, and and again, forgive me because my my Bronze Age uh, memory might be a little rusty on some of these people, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, like like I know Rick's I know Rick Stasi's name. What would I know of his uh, of his stuff? Uh, Rick did some stuff in the eighties. He did um, he, he did the um, Crimson Avenger miniseries with Roy, um, and um, he did some fill in stuff for DC. Um, in fact, in the uh, uh, the Doom Patrol um, uh, archives, the Bronze Age Doom Patrol archives, okay. they printed a uh, an unpublished fill in that I wrote uh, the pencils, and that was a uh, Rick did that job. Um, oh, okay. and, uh, yeah, Rick is a, a, a Kansas City artist, and and uh, 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 you know uh, he, he's also a, a writer and a performer, and and very talented guy. In fact, he designs my book covers. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, he's a That's graphic great. artist as well. Well, again, um, everybody here, take a look. Take a look. Yeah, there you go. So um, awesome. awesome. Yeah, and he's Did also he good. He, he's an old. He's an old friend. We we've we yeah. we met when uh, he lives in Kansas City, and uh, we met when I went out there for conventions in the eighties, and we've been pals ever since. And he sends me barbecue sauce. So, ooh, nice. What's uh, what's what's the uh, barbecue sauce? Uh, unless he sends you a variety. A variety. Usually, there's always a Zardas, and there's always a uh, an Arthur Bryant's, and then uh, you know, then then he'll surprise me with with other varieties. Very good. No, that sounds great. Uh, and again, here's another name that I know, but uh, her work is uh, escaping me, and that's Mindy Newell. Right, Mindy um, was. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I love her story. I, I I knew her. She was she was a friend back in in, in the eighties uh, when we used to hang out at DC. Um, but she was um, uh, a, a an operating an OR nurse, uh, thirty years old, a single mother, and um, on a whim she she submitted to the uh, um, New Talent Showcase uh, pro project, you know, program in the in the eighties. And uh, Karen Berger saw her stuff and liked it and started buying from her. And she uh, she did a Catwoman miniseries. She did a um, uh, uh, she did some work on, on Wonder Woman with, uh, with, uh, George, with Perez. So, yeah. And then she, you know, after a while she, um, she, uh, for her own sanity sake, she went back to, uh, to nursing. But <laughs> I see. I think she writes essays for Mike Gold's uh, website. Yes, she does. She does write for comic mix. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's very cool. And, you know, again, a lot of these people are, are old word balloon uh, guests that I always love talking to. Um, I, uh, let's see here. Uh, well, Jerry Conway, certainly my God, I, sure. you know, I love talking to Jerry and, yeah. uh, yeah. one of those guys that came in or he came in so early as a teenager, uh, writing comics. How old were you when you broke in Paul? In comparison? Uh, I was 19. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jerry was, I think 16. Uh, Jim Shooter was 13. Levitz was 16. <laughs> Who um, else was 16? Paul Paul Levitz was sixteen. Levitz, sure. Yeah. Well, you know, in in um in, in direct conversations, he's he's talking about when he got hired in like nineteen seventy three. He goes, you know, I'm sixteen years old. I don't have working papers. It could not have been legal. My employment could not have been at all legal. You know, but um, yeah, yeah. It was back in back then. You could do that. You know, you could you could be a baby and still, you know, <laughs> and still break in. And I consider myself one of the older babies, you know, at 19. Sure. No, absolutely. My God. I, uh, that's so funny, Paul, because truly I think back of when I started reading all you guys and I, it was, you know, like, all right, 73, I was nine mm -hmm. when, when Paul was breaking in yeah. and Jerry yeah. Conway, I think of, I think of Jerry and stuff. And, right. uh, some of, some of the 12 cent stuff I got as a little kid, but I really didn't read uh, deeply until I was like, 10 or 11 or whatever. Um, it's interesting uh, that uh, some of these generations, well, a lot of these guys were the first guys to kind of write to a slightly older audience because yeah. prior to that, it really was, was it, was there an edict at Charlton or DC as far as, all right, don't yeah. forget guys, you're writing for 12 year olds or whatever. No, it was understood. It was simply, you know, back in the, back in the sixties and, and at the time, you know that was kind of that was it. You know the Mort Weisinger Superman, the the Jack Schiff Batman. Uh, you know that that silly uh, those silly juvenile stories. They were writing to ten year olds, 
Um, and, you know, if you think about it, the, the, the Weisinger Superman was really like, what would a 10 year old do if he had superpowers? You know, he'd prank his mom or his sister, you know, so she couldn't discover his secret identity and she, you know, whatever. It was just, it, it was, it was all very juvenile. And we grew up, you know, my generation of, of creators uh, and the guys before me, like, like Roy and, and, and Jerry and, and, uh, you know, the like, we grew up on that stuff and we loved it, but we wanted to keep reading it when we got older and we couldn't do that if it was still going to be that same silly Mort Weisinger Superman. Um, so, you know, slowly and gradually, um, you know, I don't know how it worked at Marvel. Marvel always had, you know, a more forward thinking, uh, you know, uh, creativity uh, in the 60s. But, um, you know, DC, you know, Arnold Drake tried it with the Doom Patrol. That was the most Marvel book that DC uh, published at the time. But, um, you know, DC was slower to adapt and it was a little bit at a time. You know, if you read, <clears throat> you know, you even read the, the when, when Schwartz took over, Julie Schwartz took over Superman in 71, I think it was. That's right. Excuse me. <clears throat> no worries. You know, he was still doing, you know, he was still working with the same creators. He was still working with Carrie and, 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 and Elliot. Well, no, Elliot came in later, but you know, Carrie was one of the main writers at the time and, and the older guys, Otto Binder and, and not, not Binder. Geez. I keep naming people who aren't doing what I thought they were, they were doing. Maybe Alvin, Alvin Schwartz, maybe Alvin Schwartz. No, that was after Schwartz had already gone. This was Dorfman and, okay. and, and stuff like that. Guys like that. But, okay. um, uh, you know, but then then the younger generation kind of got in there and started doing, you know, slightly more more advanced stuff. You know, you'd see in Julie's Superman, there was that mix of the silly, you know, Edmund Hamilton type Superman and what Marv was Marv, you know, and, and Gil Kane did a run that was, you know, really good. Uh didn't yeah. last nearly long enough. Um you know, so there was, there were attempts to do stuff, and then gradually, you know, that became the the norm. It, it because the audience was aging, you know, and the and the and the market was shifting. So, was when Jeanette was brought in as publisher, Jeanette Kahn, everybody, mm -hmm. uh, really was a shot in the arm as far as oh, sure. uh, you know, fresh talent, and and really, I was reading her Scholastic magazines like Dynamite. Uh, right. Before she got the job, and it's funny, I had no idea that that was the connection that it was Jeanette. But did did Jeanette nudge things forward as far as making the writing a little more sophisticated? I mean, how? Yeah, tell me about her philosophy. From well, a I, I don't, I, you know, I don't think she, you know, she ever quite said that. But what she did do was hire guys like you know Larry Hama and Al Milgram and uh, and, and Ross Andrew as editors. Um, you know, bring these guys in some some fresh editorial talent. You know, I look. I, I think DC had one of the most talented editorial staffs that could have been assembled. You know, you had Julie Schwartz, you had Murray Bolton. I mean, Murray. You know, whatever you thought of Murray's comics, they sold. You know, Murray's Murray's uh, 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 ghosts outsold House of Mystery. You know, he, that's great. You know, yeah, you know his his book with with the you know the filipino artist uh uh you know was outselling bernie wrightson and mike kaluda in in joe orlando's books um you know his his action comics sold better than than julie superman uh, you know world's brave and bold sold better than the batman titles um you know so these 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 guys knew what they were doing you didn't necessarily have to like what they did but they certainly knew their stuff I, I loved Murray's uh, comics. I, I'm, you know, of course, he was, wasn't he editing Brave and Bold? Yeah, yeah, with the, yeah. the, the Haney years. With, uh, you right, know, the, and the, the, Conduity, the Conduity be damned. I want a Sergeant Rock Batman story. That's what we're doing, and I Absolutely. loved it. I loved it. And, you know, Haney, like, I, I, I asked Bob uh, Haney, I said, you know, what about continuity? And it was like, pretty much, what about it? Yeah, yeah because, exactly. Because I'm a grown-up. I don't have time to think about crap like that. You know, it's like, I'm just going to, let me tell the story. Um, One punchy 
whatever it was back then, 17 page, 20 page, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. What was the I, format uh, back in the 20 cent era? Can you remember? I don't remember. It might have, that might've been the, the 17 uh, page uh, time. It used I to know. shift. Yeah. Okay. Cause I know that like, because I've gone back and read them like hundred page spectaculars, yeah. the lead yeah. story would be like 17 pages. Right. Of new right. stuff, and you you know get others, and I don't even know. Again, working on as you did the Superman Family Dollar comics, uh, that was less than seventeen pages of feature, wasn't it? Uh, I think there was a lead feature that might have been fourteen pages, fourteen fifteen pages. I just had a, a reasonable look at a World's Finest I wrote from that era, and uh, that was like a fourteen page lead. So you know that might have been the case. Um, okay, and then there were ten page. I think they were 10. Yeah, I was writing. Yeah. Um, I wrote uh, Nightwing and Flame Bird in the 80, when it was the, the dollar comic format. And yep. then later on, I, I, I took over the Jimmy Olsen strip. And then I took over the Supergirl strip, from uh, both from, from Pasco, from Marty. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah, geez. Yeah. Uh, no, and uh, again, uh, so the Jimmy Olsen years of Mr. Action, which I love. Yes. Yeah. Well, I grew up. With Jose Delbo. Working with Jose Delbo, which in itself uh, is a treat. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I know the answer to this question from Stanley, but I'll let you explain. He wants All to know right. if you had any interactions with Jack Kirby or Neil Adams. Um, I met Jack a couple of times, and it was never anything more than, you know, wow, you're great. I love your style. Oh, no, no, no. You kids, you're the ones who are doing the great, you know. So Jack never let anybody uh, um, uh, compliment him, um, but that was it. You know, I did. Uh, I wrote this uh, uh, Superpowers miniseries in in '85, and uh, uh, Jack drew it. But you know, I wrote full script, and he drew what I wrote. So, you know, did you work with Jack Kirby? Well, I worked adjacent to him. You know, uh, who was the who was the editor on uh, Superpowers? Uh, Andy Helfer for the first. Oh, very one. cool. And yeah. I would imagine I mean, both of you were funneling to Andy or maybe well, not. I was, yeah, I worked, I, I plotted with Andy. I wrote the scripts. I turned them in. I didn't know Jack was going to be drawing it at first. There was no, when, when I first got the gig, frankly, I figured, oh, they're giving me the gig. Kirby can't possibly be drawing it. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, um, uh, uh, but then, yeah, it turned out it was him. And uh, then I did the follow-up uh, mini series with Joe Orlando editing but uh, uh carmen infantino and pablo pablo marcos inked it yeah excellent and then uh, neil neil um I, I i i never worked with neil but i knew neil um you know uh, i've known him since i was a kid my my brother worked at continuity and as a result wow. uh, he and neil hated each other um uh, oh honestly that in an interview neil uh, with with Ch he did an interview with Chaikin and uh, he asked about stuff that he hated. And Neil said, "I hate only three things in the world: Adolf Hitler, Saddam Hussein, and Alan Kupperberg." <laughs> so, I never found out what the deal was. But Neil was always nice to me ever since I'm a kid. Um, you know, I I uh, uh, never had a problem with him. He's always been, you know, like I say, just I, I just posted some uh, a signed cover. Uh, that I got from him on on Facebook, and a couple of people go, "How much did he charge you?" Nothing, you know. Professional courtesy. <laughs> well, because because again, you was, know, he, yeah. I mean, like the first time I had any real interaction with him, and it was like thirty seconds. But you know, it was uh, he comes rush. It was at uh, DC at nine uh, at uh, seventy five Rock. He comes rushing out of an office with his portfolio, and he's got a Polaroid camera around his neck. And he rushes past me, and then he stops. He turns. He goes, "Did I take your picture?" And were you supposed to? Yeah, shut up! Get, you know, stand against the wall. So I stood against the wall. Click. He took my Polaroid picture, and he runs off. And then later, I show up on the cover of the Superman Muhammad Ali comic in the audience. So, <laughs> <you know. laughs> but you know, so like, if not for him, I would not have been on that cover. So how's that's that awesome. for a nice gesture? Yeah. That's pretty amazing. And especially given that uh, the original cover art for that was Joe Kubert. And yeah. then yeah. I don't know why it was handed to Neil. Obviously, Neil did the interiors. And I know he had to change a few things, 
like John Wayne didn't want to be on the cover, so they had to put the mustache. Yeah, Johnny on. Carson got changed. John Wayne got changed. A few, a few faces uh, they couldn't get approvals for. But I don't know what the change was. But I'm, um, I'm assuming it was, uh, you know, Neil going, "Hey, I'm drawing the book. I get the cover too, don't I?" <laughs> you know, could be. Um, I, I, and I know he, you know, I know he, I know he admired Kubert. Uh, you know, I know that he had, uh, but there was also a kind of uh, Steve Mitchell talked about it in the Direct Conversations book that there was also this kind of professional rivalry between uh, Joe and Neil. Um, you know, he he told the story uh, about uh, 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 Joe bringing the Tarzan pages, and uh, you know, and and Neil was there at the time, and he sees them, and he goes, "Oh, you know, I draw Tarzan too." And, and and so he he goes in and he does a tar he does his Tarzan and comes out and shows it to Joe and Joe just kind of takes it and looks at it and then you know takes out a piece of tissue paper and he's going you know well here's what here's what I would do with this and you know but Neil stood there and took it because you know it's Joe Kubert but I, I think they really they really respected each other uh, but I, I'm pretty sure it was just a matter of, of of you know it being this being Neil's book and it should be Neil's cover as well, and I'm sure the the likeness uh, when they came up with the likeness idea, that probably played into it as well. Understood. You know my favorite where I and, and I shouldn't have been surprised. I always had great conversations podcast wise with Neil and also at his tables at conventions, mm -hmm. but um, I remember uh, mistakenly referring to a lot of the Batman artists of the '70s as kind of taking uh what neil did as the lead and then kind of doing their mm -hmm. own thing and you know i i i'm trying some names weren't aren't coming to mind right now but the one that i made the mistake on and neil really was like no 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 was i'm like you know jim i, I go to me jim aparo's batman was very reminiscent of your style he's like no he's like jim's an individual jim jim had a very individual style and I, I always like Jim's style. And Jim's like, he goes, I'm sorry, the other guys you mentioned, I would agree with you. But uh, no, the exception is Jim, which I thought was fantastic because yeah. Jim is, uh, much like Neil, Jim is another signature Batman artist. Absolutely. Um, his, the the Bob Haney, Neil Adams, uh, uh, Bob Haney, uh, well, Neil Adams, Jim Aparo, Batman from Brave and Bold is my favorite rendition, of, you know, my, my favorite portrayal of Batman, of Bruce Wayne particularly. Um, sure. Yeah. You know. I mean, uh, Haney wrote Bruce Wayne better than anybody. You know, I also loved, uh, and again, makes no sense from continuity, but I loved when Wildcat was a regular yeah. in play yeah. as Batman's partner and stuff. And it was, you know, man, he he drew a, a really realistic Wildcat, and also the bike looked great, the bo the motorcycle. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, I did thought it was Wild, true. Did he use Wildcat in an issue of Spectre too, Neil? I'm sure he did. I'm sure yeah. he did. Yeah, in fact, no, absolutely, Neil did. But I'm saying yeah. Jim uh, doing Brave oh, and Bold. Oh, yeah. oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. No, you're right about Spectre and Neil using him in the Spectre. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's great stuff. Now, we mentioned uh, Carmine and Supergirl, and Ange must have been on our wavelength because he wants to know what it was like working with Carmine and Fantino on Supergirl. Was it full script or Marvel style? Did he brainstorm with you? Never brainstormed. Uh, uh, you know, I don't remember. I think it was, yeah, it was full script. It was full script. Uh, that and Superboy I, I wrote. And the Superman stuff I did, for, mostly for Schwartz, I wrote full script. I may have done a couple of issues of, an issue or two of DC Comics Presents as own plot, but otherwise it was a full script. Um, no, Carmine, um, I, I, Carmine didn't care. You put it in front, you know, it, it was like you put it in front of Carmen and he drew it. He didn't care. It was like it was his job. He was, um, you know, if I uh, if I said to him, I think I once said to him, hey, anything you want to, you know, you want to do? No, you know, whatever you're doing, keep doing. OK, great. You know, fine. He was no interest in, in uh, you know, in anything beyond his his penciling duties. And it was beautiful stuff. I mean, when I say he didn't care, you know, he still couldn't help but be a great freaking artist. No, I understand, Paul, because truly, and I'm glad you're uh, able to tell these stories because sometimes I feel some of my fellow podcasters put a lot of these guys on pedestals. And it's like, you know, they were, they, they made brilliant art 
but they were just slugging out, you know, nine to five or whatever they were drawing yeah. on were and, and getting a check. And, and with that, I was a grumpy, miserable old fuck, you know, he just, he really was, you know, I would see him at conventions and, and he'd be sitting at the table and it'd be like, you know, like the Grinch, just kind of, you know, and, and I would like, eh, I'm not going to go over now. <laughs> you know, I, I the first, uh, I saw him after years um, uh, at a con convention in New York and I went up to him and I said, Hey, Carmen, how you doing? You know, I held him my hand and he looked at my hand and he looked at me and he said, you still working for those sons of bitches. <laughs> I said, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I left staff. I'm freelance now. And he went, oh, all right. And then, how you doing, Paul? You know, but. <laughs> well, again, I, I mean, he was he was one of the bosses and then got dismissed and, you know, was shown yeah, the door. Yeah. So I can appreciate that. Of course, then we got they got him at Marvel and was doing great Star Wars comics as long as he was and everything. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, again, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of his stuff. You know, Carmine. Uh, I've said this before, uh, you know, uh, people growing up, uh, fans coming up in the 60s, they all talk about their their holy trinity being, you know, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Steve Ditko. Mine are Julie Schwartz, Carmen Infantino, and Gil Kane. Um, you know, I, 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 I love and admire what was going on at Marvel, but, you know, if I didn't have the money, Marvels didn't get bought. You know, they they came after DCs and, like, even Charlton's and, and other stuff. Wow. So, wow. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, uh, but, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was very much very, very, so Carmine, you know, and he drew two of the, two of the most important comics of the, you know, in the history that it was showcase number four and, and flash one twenty three, the flash of two worlds, you know, that introduced the, yeah, it introduced the 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 uh, uh, you know the multiverse concept, and it introduced it, and we're still you know comics are still running on that. That's you know that's what it's all about, and it it grabbed me because the multiverse you know as I've said before, the the headline in the newspaper and the story is June fourteenth, nineteen sixty one, and my birthday is June fourteenth. So, you know, the multiverse was born on my birthday. And that, you know, nailed it for me as a fan. That's fantastic, yeah. man. Yeah. Now, isn't, it, isn't it interesting, Paul, that because, again, like you, uh, seeing my first uh, exposure to the idea of parallel universes and parallel Earths came from Gardner Fox, all those fantastic stories. They were still yeah. reprinting them along with new ones written by guys like Len Wein and Jerry Conway and the like in the seventies. But I was reading those first, uh, you know, all you know, earth two stories. And I always say that, uh, I, I immediately fell in love with the idea of Alan Scott because I had read Hal Jordan stories and, and I forget what showcase it was, but I know in a hundred page spectacular, they reran the showcase issue of Dr. Fate and our man te teaming up yeah. Yeah, yeah. against yeah. Solomon Grundy. And at the end of the story, Alan Scott shows up. And it's like, oh, Green Lantern, thank God you're here. And it's like, what? I'm like, the blonde guy is Green Lantern with the red blouse and the purple yeah, right. cape? What, what the hell's going on? And I immediately fell in love with that design. And I'm like, I want to read more Alan Scott stories because clearly this is a very different Green Lantern. And I loved Hal Jordan, but I'm just like, who's this guy? And I yeah. right now, Tim Sheridan is doing a great job showing us an Alan Scott year one uh, portrayal. But um, as much as I've loved and always have parallel universes and parallel worlds in comics, man, in those Marvel movies, they kind of have beat it to death, the idea of a yeah. parallel Earth and multiverses and stuff. And I don't know what your thought is on, on the concept. Uh, well, I, you know, it, it's, it's a great concept. And, and it, you know, as, as you see, it, when used judiciously, it offers, you know, uh, it used to be an annual event in, in, at DC. You yes, know, there would be, it would be the 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 big JLA JSA crossover, um, yep. and that was a thing which we waited for. You know, I I remember in in um, I guess seventy one, um, the uh, that was around uh, number one hundred the Len the the Seven Soldiers of Victory crossover that Len did. Yeah, um, with uh, and Paul was working at 
DC or he had just gotten the, he had been up at DC getting the news for the comic reader or something and he yeah, knew yeah. he knew who was going to die he knew which member of the seven soldiers victor was going to die and he wouldn't tell us you know and i remember he was like you got to tell us man you know you can't come on which one is it which one is it because yeah. one of our That's friends it. actually collected leading comics <laughs> which was the seven soldier comic book Victor, of the of right? the golden age that's yeah. fantastic wow yeah. man because yeah and uh and uh, you know no, i'm not going to spoil if you haven't read the story everybody you, you should read the story uh it's a, and horse. Also, it's a horse it's a horse, horse. Oh. yeah it was the shiny it was the shiny knight's horse exactly oh wing victory is dead oh call the group <laughs> actor. no no it's a hero everybody don't worry <laughs> but i love it and and um yeah and also just seeing things like different from the seven soldiers but like um, seeing a Simon and Kirby Sandman story sure. of him in the yellow and purple superhero outfit. And then I even remember one of those crossover stories where Wesley Dodds is back and he puts the, the double-breasted suit and the fedora and the gas mask back on and yeah. something happens that makes him rip apart his, uh, his original uniform. And that's when they find uh, Sandy, who, was not die who did not die in Seven Soldiers' uh, the JLA JSA crossover, right. but Sandy was a you know, but but yeah, and then they found Sandy and he was like a sand monster, right? And they calmed him down, and then subsequently, 20 years later, Jeff Johns puts him back in the JSA as sand, and maybe even the uh, maybe even Infinity Inc. prior to him being in the, the JSA. Yeah, I don't remember, it was hard to keep track, yeah, <laughs> but but no, it was great, and it's just like I, I just, I, well, first of all, I always loved. The design of the golden age co uh, costumes mm -hmm. so many of them are so great starman with that fin and and it just the whole the that whole was a sweet costume yeah. yeah yeah there was something you know there was i i remember discovering uh jules pfeiffer's the great comic book heroes which is you know a a, a book that comes up frequently in in the creativity interviews um you know it was published in 1965 uh, you know the the Written material by Pfeiffer aside, which is brilliant, um, uh, it reprinted Golden Age sea origins of characters, you know, in a time when that stuff didn't exist. You know, you, there was no way to see the spirit. I had never seen the spirit before. I had never seen, pla well, I, I think plast I may have seen Plastic Man. DC brought back Plastic Man around that same time. But when you read a Jack Cole story compared to, I love Plastic Man. Plastic Man, I think, is the is the greatest strip of the 1940s. Jack Cole's Plastic Man is a brilliant comic strip. Um, I love the character. Nobody since Jack Cole has ever done it right, including myself. And I've written him a few times. Just wow. Nobody has gotten it right. It's just, it was Jack, it was so uniquely Cole that, you know, to my mind, nobody, nobody has managed to, to get it, uh, you know, correct. But I, all this stuff, you know, was just. Oh, actually, I I I knew the Plastic Sam parody in Mad in Mad Comics. There was a uh, uh, from uh, we had the Mad uh, paperbacks that reprinted all the old Mad comic book stories, and I'd been reading those since I was like six seven years old. And there was there was Plastic Sam, which Russ Heath drew, which was a wow. parody. On the, yeah, yeah, I think it was the only. Might have been the only mad comic thing he ever did, um, but um, uh, yeah. So I, I, I kind of like, oh, that's what you know. Sure. And, and it's it's a brilliant strip. But there was all that you know. There, there was all those things. Wonder Woman and 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 uh, you know Green Lantern and and uh, uh, you know just it just it just like you know it, it was like finding the the Rosetta Stone. You know, and then the stuff that Pfeiffer wrote about being a young fan and a kid getting into the business. And he he worked for uh, he went to work for the uh, Eisner shop eventually and wrote and and, and drew, uh, uh, you know, some of the later a lot of the later spirits. And, um, you know, but the stories he told about the golden age, you know, those those hard scrabble, you know, cheating lying backstabbing you know publishers and by the way nothing has changed um <laughs> and, uh uh they you know the, those stories it's just like 
I want to live in 1942 and wear a fedora and, you know, write comic books on my manual typewriter. I so hear you, man. And, and yeah. really, uh, boy, there's a lot to unpack of that, of that, uh, you know, what you just put out there. First of all, regarding Plastic Man, I know several A-list creators in the 19 years that I've been doing Word Balloon are like, I really want to bring him back. I really want to bring Plastic Man back to that Jack Cole vibe and the police comics vibe. And I, yeah. I appreciated what Wade did uh, with Plastic Man in his JLA run. And there were moments where you saw Eel O'Brien and that dark side to Eel and stuff prior to becoming, I mean, Jack's yeah. books were just crazy joy. And in, in as I remember them, in the few that I've read. And, yeah. it, and also yeah. mentioning Pfeiffer, first of all, it's fantastic that Pfeiffer is in his mid nineties and still with us. Yeah. I, he's, I, still I, I, he's still creating. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know he had a graphic novel or something just a couple of years ago yeah. and it's man, we are, we are so fortunate and, and uh, God, what a Renaissance man in terms of the very, you know, the plays that he's written, the novels that he's written, the short stories and the comics. We're very lucky to have had Pfeiffer and oh, yeah. it's a guy that people need to know more about. Uh, as far as his uh, comic book contributions, but but the great comic book heroes, I bought it ten years later in the seventies, and and it much and and there were so few great books about the comics and the uh, a critical look at the comics and a, and an informational look at the Golden Age comics. You know what's awesome? Um, I I when when Cameo was brand new for the show that I do with Art Baltazar and Franco. Uh, we we always one of our one of our other co-hosts is from Toledo, Ohio. Our buddy Scott McMahon, Scoot McMahon, is mm -hmm. a great artist, fantastic artist, and uh, you know he's lived with Jamie Farr as this cultural right. person in Toledo, Ohio. So we got a cameo of Jamie Farr, and he talked for like three minutes. But we're like, tell us about your favorite comics because we had seen a Mike Douglas episode where. Um, Oh, God, yeah. the, the guy who used to put on the the, the original New York uh, Comic Cons, Phil Suling. Phil Suling. Phil Suling is there with a bunch of Golden Age comics, and Jamie is hanging on every word. Oh, I had that one. Oh, I had that. Oh, I remember Hawkman. I remember the Specter. Wow. And the same thing happened when we had uh, him on. He put up a comic strip encyclopedia, and he said, "I love this." And then he put up Pfeiffer's book, and he's like, "This book is great." And he goes, oh, my God, the memories of Hawkman and the Spectre. And it's like, that's awesome, because everyone can mention Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman and Spider-Man, right. whatever. Yeah, but you, but, start, you start digging deep in those days. Absolutely, yeah, man. Now everybody, now everybody, I mean, it's like we live in a world where Iron Man is a major star. Iron freaking man. Please. <laughs> it was a C book. You know, Submariner, Iron Man, C books. Yeah, Stan well, never knew what to do with those guys. Who didn't? Stan, I don't think Stan ever knew what to do with those guys. Uh, I understand. Well, yeah, you know, I heard from guys like Starlin and Roy, uh, and and Starlin working on Iron Man in the in the not selling days and stuff. Yeah, and and it is amazing. Well, to me, the even better example, especially with Marvel, are Groot and Rocket Raccoon. And I remember when Bendis and Casada are telling me, "Oh my God." Our next movie, Guardians of the Galaxy, and I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, aren't yeah. those like see a deal? They're like, you will not believe the ideas that are coming out of this movie. It's going to make them household names, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, yeah. you say so. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, no, I know it's 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 weird. What you know, you you can't get a good Superman movie made, but you know, well, let's see. I'm Three rock and record. You know, yes. oh, go on. You, you're no, hoping I'm, I'm, saying, I, I'm just, I hope that, that James Gunn manages to pull it off. I would, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't have a lot of energy about superhero movies because they're just that. They're superhero movies. You know, the comic books are here. They're fine. They're, they're unchanged. I can always go back to them. The movies are like, well, I can see it or not see it. It does, you know, it doesn't matter to me. It's a different thing. Well, what I say to my friends that I've cultivated in these 19 years that are players in the, in the television and movie field. And I'm like, listen, I know I'm just another asshole reader giving you their two cents and you'll forgive me. But 
everybody needs to come up with a better third act that we we've had now since the first Iron Man movie, where it's you know superhero versus big CGI thing. Yeah, and yeah. whether it's a god or you know Iron Monger in the first Iron Man uh, movie, you know, Wonder Woman, the, the the first Wonder Woman movie was great until the third act, and it's like, oh look, another giant monster. Yeah, and it gets boring. Yeah, it gets boring, and I mean, you guys are turning what has been, in my case, a fifty-plus year of excitement and thrills reading these things to. Yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll see Blue Beetle. Maybe I won't see Blue Beetle. Maybe I won't see. I still haven't seen the Marvels, even though it's sitting on Disney Plus now. And, yeah, I, and again, I, I, I don't seen, know. I, I've never I never saw the second half of the uh, of, of the last Avengers thing. So, yeah. Oh, you know, I got to say, and they they stuck the landing on Endgame. They did. Okay. They, you know, so you know, it's great. Right? Paul, I don't I don't know if you're an anime guy at all. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, because honestly. Yeah. Palmiati and Franco are like, dude, you got to see Blue Eyed Samurai. It is so great on Netflix. And it's a fantastic little mini series. And it's very Lone Wolf and Cub, or name your favorite, or uh, The Blind Swordsman, name your favorite, you know, kind of. Uh, and I understand that. So I get that totally. Uh, now, here, Peter I like Astro show. Boy. I remember I liked Astro Boy a lot. Loved Astro Boy so much. So, absolute speed racer. Yeah. Uh, Peter. I Pete Beiser says excited for Dune Part Two genre, but not another superhero flick. Well, I'm not. I'm not at that point because again, even right now, the staleness of these Act Threes, they're one great film away from turning it all around. Yeah, and I and I and I have much as you do. I have hope with James Gunn. I think he's shown us with his Suicide Squad movie and the three Guardians of the Galaxy movies. He he understands what makes these things tick. Yeah, and could bring interesting yeah. ideas. I don't know. Did you see the? Did you see his Suicide Squad movie? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know the Peacemaker uh, connection uh, uh, sucked me in. Uh, so uh, you know, so yes, I I saw it. It was big, goofy superhero fun. Uh, you know, Starro, I'm there. Um, yeah, and and I and I enjoyed the the mini series. I thought it was you know again, you can't take this seriously. <laughs> you know, it's just it's over the top. You know, shoot them up, blood and guts. Uh, uh, it, it's like you know what Tarantino does. It 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 jacks it up into the level of the absurd, and you know, that's a that yeah, that's a good comparison, man. Because you know when you when you wrote Vigilante, when you wrote Peacekeeper, it was maker, kind of maker peacemaker. Paul, I, oh, I do it. I do it every time. Every time. <laughs> every time. And not just you, because I had Kyle Starks on, and and he was doing a Peacemaker uh, a miniseries as well. No, Peacekeeper. I get... See, motherfucker. <laughs> Damn it. Peacekeeper. Peace Peacemaker. Keeper. Right. All right. Okay. Now you're confusing me because peace... that was my, that was my goal. Peacemaker is the superhero. Okay. Peacekeeper is the peace George. Maker, peacemaker, make me a peace. Go ahead. <laughs> A song they threw out of Fiddler they, on the Roof. They, they didn't use it. I didn't. I don't um, know why. But uh, peace, peacekeeper is peace. the. Well, wait, because I'm saying the other one first. Oh, okay, okay. Peacemaker is the superhero. Peacekeeper is the George Clooney, Nicole Kidman action film that came out in the very late '90s. I want to yeah. say even pre Batman and Robin, and is a good George Clooney action film. Yes, it for is. What, you know. But, but yeah, it's so it's certainly, certainly not. But uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> Linda, very nice. Thank don't you. Don't worry, I will, Don. And uh, who's on left? And exactly, I don't know. Yeah. third base. But, but those characters were great. Um, oh, now wait a minute, man. Now they're saying Peacemaker is also the name of the Clooney film. All right, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. All right. Jesus. Don't drink before the interviews, John. Cardinal lesson. Yeah. Uh, but, but, again, but again, you were your stuff was of that grim and gritty era. Yeah. With Vigilante and um the guy John Cena plays. But okay. uh, you know, but uh but and, and that's the thing, and I think you're right that 
um, in the in both the Suicide Squad, uh, Suicide Squad film, and in the uh, limited TV series so far, they have taken it to this violence, uh, violent comedy, in a, in a in a great way. Would you ever want to write um, the characters in in those veins? In the way Gunn has them, yes. The way Gunn, um, yeah, I, I think that could be fun. I mean, you know, it it it's essentially the character that I wrote. It's just you know he's just ratcheted up the absurdity by about you know a factor of ten. But right. um, but it really essentially is that same. You know, I when I took on Peacemaker. I started, I picked it up from Marv after like 20 issues or so. And, you know, Marv was, well, it's a superhero comic. And, I, and I'm looking at him going, no, it's a comic about a crazy guy. Because, you know, he, so he he's a criminal court judge and he puts on a, a, a costume and takes a gun and takes care of the, the stuff he doesn't like that he can't resolve in the courtroom. That's not, not crazy. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Um, so I wrote him like that, you know, I mean, I, he, he, he was never rolling his eyes and going cuckoo, but you know, his thoughts and his rationalization and, and, and his actions were certainly that of a crazy man. And eventually, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't really know the timing. Uh, I, 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 you know, like had dark Knight come out by the time I was doing that stuff or, or was that just, cause that was like what, 85, 80, you know, they were certainly close. Yeah. They were certainly mm -hmm. close. I mean, I was there at the, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I was there at the, the, the edge of the grim and gritty, I guess, with that stuff. Although I, I you know, I, I always tended to think of myself more as a, you know, a Superman writer. <laughs> but I understand. But yeah. it, but it's great that you did it and you went to the extreme that you did where there was no choice. This guy had to uh, either get arrested or end his yeah. life as he did. And it was a bold choice, and it was, uh, I think, handled maturely. We did a whole panel on it at Terrificon. Was it yeah. last year, two years ago? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm so glad we did because I think it's really interesting. And the whole idea of antiheroes and the way they're being played these days, um, you're seeing more of them, but they're not allowed to go to the extremes that you guys did when nobody was looking or there was yeah. less corporate overseeing of, of these things. Yeah, it's like you know the Peacemaker miniseries. Um, it you know they, they didn't reprint DC didn't reprint it, um, and you know it, you can't these days. You I mean just, the Vigilante you know, series? Excuse me. No, no, no. The um, the the Peacemaker miniseries that I wrote with uh, oh that I did with Todd Smith. You know, uh, it, it, it it's portrayal of Middle Eastern you know terrorism, and the villain was Doctor Sinsen. That you know. The sure. really racist Asian villain from Batman. I hear you. Um, so you know you, yeah. you know they they didn't even reprint it, even though the 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 character was popular. So Paul, what did they put in that uh, recent uh, reprint? Uh, you know, uh, peace uh, peacekeeper uh, comic that you that you didn't you, didn't you have stories in that? No, no, I didn't. I didn't see any. None of your stuff was in there. Okay. I, I, nothing I've seen recently. I mean, I this is, uh, a, this is just a couple of years ago, probably when yeah, the when the TV show was running. Yeah, okay. no the only the only collection I saw was a uh, uh, I got uh, uh, one from France that reprinted the uh, issues of Vigilante Peacemaker was in and the the miniseries, but it's in French, so I don't know what it's about. Oh wow! Oh. Well, um, all right. Mike Jones tries to clarify for me. Uh, Peacemaker with Clooney came out in 97. And then he says at the same time, a cash-in Peacekeeper with Dolph Lundgren came out. I don't remember this at all. Yeah. Well, wow. you know, because Dolph Lundgren movies are usually so memorable. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we do remember when he played the Punisher. You know. Well, you do. <laughs> No, oh, I you remember, remember that? that he did. I remember that he did, but I don't think I, I'm sure I didn't oh, see the movie. I didn't I didn't see it either. You know, on Tubi, there's a fantastic is it Bill Black that does Americomics or AC comics with yeah. Femme Force and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. This incredible documentary about him from like 2012, and it's on Tubi, everybody, for free. You just gotta sit through the commercials. 
but it's a great thing and all about his uh the comics that he made but also kind of like don glut he made a lot of independent like cheese ball monster movies and superhero movies as well I didn't know that. yeah and especially like fem force movies and his characters and stuff so mm. you know yeah I, oh that's interesting i guess mike is telling us that his peacekeeper dolph's movie was a cash in maybe knockoff of the Clooney movie, not the DC character. I see. Oh yeah, that's what I assumed. Yeah, that, 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 that makes that, sense. Yeah, yeah. I gotta say, I I've come to appreciate Dolph as he's gotten older, and I've I've caught some of his direct-to-video movies over the years. And man, in uh, Creed two, he's outstanding, <laughs> and it is such a wonderful bookend to Rocky four. Right. Yeah, that up, everybody. That's Rocky six. But um. They, uh, the, man, their scenes together where the hate is still there, and you know, it's so great because you know, like Stallone is down here, right. Dolphin's and, up there, and Stallone is totally all eye contact. It's like, all right, it's time for you to get out of my restaurant right now. And it's like, you know, Ro Rocky knows he's like two feet taller, yeah. and you probably will yeah. destroy him, but he's just like, I don't need your shit, pal, get the fuck out. And it was so, it was so great. Now, the, <laughs> and the only Dolph being funny, Dolph was great. The, the the only uh, action star, uh, you know, uh, cheesy action star that that I found that redeemed himself for me was John Claude Van Damme. He did this film about I think it's called uh, uh, JCVD. That's right. Where he plays himself and he's a hostage in a bank robbery. Yep. And it's a really good movie. You know, it's a, oh. and he's good in it. I, I was very surprised. I just you know came in on it and just started watching out of curiosity. And, and how to sit through it. It's fantastic. I agree. There's also um, an Amazon, and maybe the chat will be able to tell me the title of it, but there's an Amazon series. They only, they only made one season of it where he actually is a secret agent and his cover is being the movie star yeah. that he is. Okay. And, okay. It, and it's very funny. It's a little more silly than JCVD was, but right. it works. You, got, you give him credit for having that... Um, Oh, that self awareness. Humor. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, another guy, another guy that made his bones in action movies, and I think in his later career really like showed us even more, with the exception of Blade Runner, which he did in his action movie prime. Rucker Howard. I think Rucker yeah. Howard really. I, I love him in uh, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, the Chuck Barris movie he made with Sam mm -hmm. Rockwell. He had a great part in that. He was great as Morgan Edge in the Smallville TV show. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, they, these guys are talented. You know, they just somehow they get, I don't know, maybe, maybe the accent is, you know, they get some typecast and, and uh, especially back in those days, you know. Uh, uh, now it seems every, uh, my girlfriend is, is is English. So, you know, all I watch is British shows. So it's, uh, so, oh. but, <laughs> but yeah, you know, the, there, there was some talent in those guys. They just, you know, the material was, was just for me, unwatchable. I, I'm not a big genre movie fan. Like, I don't like science fiction. I, I have no use for horror whatsoever. It's to be the, the most boring genre in the world. It's like, well, this is what I do for a living. I know what's going to jump out of the closet and when, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, so, and superhero films, I'm very selective. I, I'm, you know, I, yeah, that, that stuff just doesn't interest me a lot. No, I, I totally understand. All right. Mentioning British TV. Have you seen, cause I, I used to have BritBox. I used to have Acorn. I had too many streamers, so I had to cut them loose. Yeah. One thing that might bring me ultimately back to BritBox is this Jason Isaacs, Cary Grant miniseries, Archie. Oh, don't, don't, uh, don't, no, don't, don't. It's very no? disappointing. It wow. Very disappointing. Yeah. Wow. All yeah. right. And I, I trust you, Paul, because you're an old movie freak like me. Yeah, and, no, uh, I, I mean, he was good. The guy was good, and 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 whoever played Diane Cannon was was really good, but it was all too fluffy, you know. I don't think you really got, um, you know, I, I wanted more. I, I just thought it was just it, it it focused on on the fluff and not not the guy. Wow, because yeah. such a complicated guy and so many yeah, I mean, touch on it problems, yeah. you know. Yeah. The, and the, I like, and I know this, the classic. The classic quote of everyone telling him, "Oh God, I wish I was Cary Grant." Him going, "Yeah, me too." Yeah, you know. What are you going to say yeah. about it, please? No, it's just you know he had the, he had the, this very fraught relationship with his mother and his 
and you know his his his, his father who had disappeared, and uh, you know it's it's all a, it's a sad sad story. But you know I, I just kind of I, I didn't feel like it really went where it could have gone. Um, uh, you know it, there was uh, it was it, you know it, it it was no John Adams. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I love John Adams. I watch it every Fourth of July. It's yeah. so great. Oh yeah. my god! And also I gotta say. Again, through the through the miracle of modern makeup, Jesus, I never would have cast Jason Isaacs as Cary Grant, but God damn it, he looks like you know, yes, sixty year old Cary Grant. I mean, my God, to a T. Yeah, no, he was he was good. Again, he was good. I just you know, I, I thought it just, uh, but you know, it was um, uh, you know, it was produced by the family and Diane Cannon, I believe. So it was. You know. And, and yeah. Carrie's daughter, their daughter, Jennifer, as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, a, a bit of a hagiography there, but, you know. All right. Fair enough. How about have you watched, and it's more French than British, but uh, Clive Owen uh, and Monsieur Sp uh, Spade, have you heard about this? No, not yet. Not yet. We haven't gotten to that yet. But uh, I, I just started I'm watching sure. it last night, and it's uh, it's got my interest. And I always love Clive Owen. I think he's, uh, yeah. I wonder if he asked for too much money. To be James Bond because his career was certainly flying. When if he if he were ever considered, I just thought it was so on the nose. And maybe that's yeah. the problem with the Broccoli's. Maybe they thought it was too on the nose to go to him instead of Daniel. It Craig. could be. I mean, you know, it, it was just uh, he really was. You know, he really does kind of fit that mold. Uh, you know, the the dark haired. Uh, uh, you know, craggy. You know, kind of. Yeah, yeah. It could be. It could be. And, um, and he's a good. He's a good choice for Sam Spade, frankly. Oh sure, so well, my favorite he, Bond movie is Majesty's Secret Service. So you know, <laughs> best written Bond film. Yes, and it's I the think most faithful to the book. Yeah, and I think Lazenby was, and I don't mean this in a in a mean way, but was was good enough. Oh sure, uh, to, to play the role and everything in that film. Oh, no, I like. Yeah, that's the only, a great. The, role. the only downside was Telly Savalas, but you know, you can. <laughs> he was the villain, so what the hell. Yeah, Blofeld. He was he was the second uh, blo or third blow. I'm doing. I'm trying to do the math. Second Blofeld. Okay. Charles Gray. Charles Gray was the third in uh, Diamonds Are Forever. Right. Okay. And of course, Donald Pleasance, the original Blofeld. Goes so, without saying. Yes. All right. A couple more comments from the chat. Sure, uh, Stanley sure. wants to know: Do you like Ambush Bug? Oh yeah, I love Ambush Bug. I mean, I you know I I uh, uh, Keith introduced him you know first brought him up he was in the room plotting with julie schwartz one of the rare times i actually sat down and got to plot with a with a with an artist back in those days um in the bronze age days you know uh but um yeah he we were plotting an issue of dc comics presents and uh gonna be using the the new doom patrol superman the new doom patrol and we were kind of started talking about a bad guy and keith said well i got this character uh he's not really a villain and he described him as Bugs Bunny with a teleportation device. And I said, let's do that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I loved it. It was it was a lot of fun. I, I used the character again in uh, um, uh, Supergirl. I, I brought the character uh, a few years later and used him in Supergirl as well. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed him. That's cool. But he's uh, a character. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Just absolutely. I, I did not. I did not. I had nothing to do with the creation of ambush bug, I was merely the facilitator of his first appearance. Any any good Keith uh, story that you want to share? Not really. I mean, you know, I like Keith. He was uh, he, he he was you know one of my favorite curmudgeons. Uh, you know, he, he was, uh, but he was a talented guy, and he was always he was always interesting to 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 hang with and, and talk to, and you know, um, and uh, was never shy about his uh, about his opinion. I was very fortunate to get him. Before he kind of decided not to do any more interviews or panels yeah. and everything. And I'm really glad because we had a great conversation and told me about like, you know, when Wally Wood was uh, told, hey, you know, Power Girl's bust is a little too big. Really? Hold my beer. Let me, <laughs> let me get a little bigger in the next issue and stuff like that. And I, and I told him I loved how when they brought uh, the Golden Age Superman back in um, those all-star comics of the Super Squad. Yeah, uh, you know, and yet that first shot of Clark Kent as editor of the Daily Star, and it was such a, in my opinion, Joe Schuster looking 
bit of art. Well, and you know, yeah. even in that even in that DC even in that DC Comics presents with Ambush Bug that he that he drew. If you look at his suit in there, it's very uh, it's very Schuster, you know, very Schuster inspired. Did um did you write um because I know I have that um showcase black and white collection of DC presents stories, and there is a there is a Earth One Earth Two Superman story that's different from I think it's different from the Ambush Bug story because the art was. Maybe Swanderson. I don't even know who drew it. Yeah, but but I, it was. No, I um I think that was uh, I no that wasn't my story. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That made um, or something. I guess Don met uh, Cary Grant back at uh, Caesars when he was nine years old. He seemed fifty. You knew Cary Grant old. when he was nine years old. Wow. Well, he, well you know. Oh, means. when he was nine years old. He no, was... that's. <laughs> um, no, that's amazing. I I. Uh, uh, the the biggest Hollywood star I ever got near was uh, Jimmy Stewart. Wow! Um, yeah, yeah, that was pretty good. He was he was waiting to cross the street at Fifty uh, Second Street and Seventh Avenue. He was waiting red light with his wife, and they were standing there. And I pull up, you know, I'm standing there. I, I get to the and I look up, and there's you know Jimmy fucking Stewart standing next to me. And I don't want to make a big deal out of it, so I just say very quiet. I go. Excuse me, Mr. Stewart. I don't. I don't want to. You know, but I just want to thank you. I appreciate everything you. Well, awesome. well, thank you, young man. That was very nice. And then the light turned green. And he went away. That's great, so, man. Uh, yeah. When I was when I was uh, seventeen, uh, my stepmother and I went to L.A. and we went to one of those autograph shows at uh, what mm -hmm. is now the Beverly Garland Hotel, but back then it was still the Sportsman's Lodge, and just this array of character actors were there. And I got to meet Kay Luke, and he was amazing. Number one son yeah. from the Charlie Chaplin movie, yeah. Charlie, Chan, Charlie Chan films. Uh, Jock Mahoney, Yancey Derringer was there. And um, the best was, as they were walking in, it was almost like a premiere where we were all outside, and they were to walk into the hotel, and then we were allowed in. And I see this guy, and I'm like, oh, I know who that is. Oh, uh, uh, oh, he played mentor on uh, the Shazam TV show. And then I go, Les Tremaine. And he heard me, and he's like, in that in that fantastic radio quality voice, yes. yes. And I'm like, oh, sir, I'm like, I'm such a fan. And then Lou Ayers, and Lou Ayers was so cute. Oh man, I'm Doctor like, Kildare. And that's what I told him. I'm like, oh, I, I watched the Doctor Kildare movie. He's like, how old are you? I'm like 17. He's like, why are you wasting time watching that stuff I made 40 years ago? I'm like, it's cool, man. <laughs> All right, here's one for you: the Andy Hardy movies and the Doctor Kildare movies are in the same universe. Tell me why. Fantastic. Because when Lou Ayers left the series, he was replaced by Van Johnson and Key Luke. And Key Luke played, I forget the doctor's name, but there was a, an Andy Hardy movie where they had to send a doctor from the hospital to uh, to Carvel to for, for, for Judge Hardy. And it was that character from the uh, Dr. Kildare movie. It was, it was Key Luke or it was Van Johnson? It was Key Luke in, as the wow. same I'm doctor, you know, yada, yada. From yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, you know, so it was like, well, there they are. Andy That's Hardy and Dr. Kildare exist in the same universe. Wow. I Pretty love forward the Andy thinking. Hardy movies. Yeah, I, well, I love the Andy Hardy movies. I haven't seen that one, but pretty forward thinking of yeah. them to put Key Just Luke have an Asian Kildare. doctor. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely, man. No, that's cool. And, yeah. of course, Van Johnson. I, the that whole golden age of how, uh, well, specifically – during the war, poor Van Johnson had this auto accident that literally cracked yeah. his head open. It probably kept him out of the service because of it. And be, I mean, he's, he, he, you know, obviously recovered, but it was right in the heart of the war years. And yeah. so, you yeah. know, they were able with makeup, basically cover all the scars. And he, especially, was, he, was in the middle of, he was in the middle of filming something like, you know, 30 seconds over Tokyo or something like that. And uh, yeah, you can see in the movies that, you know, you can see those scars especially now when you're watching this stuff on high def, you know, it used to be on old grainy black and white TVs. Didn't matter. You couldn't see this stuff, but now you can, you can see the strings now, you know? Yeah. The only time I think even in a, um, a theatrical release, seeing him where they put less makeup on him was the cane mutiny. And you mm -hmm. could justify it as a war vet that right. obviously seen combat and stuff. And, you yeah. know, kind of like the scars show. But it's funny you say that about K. Luke uh, crossing over to uh, the Andy Hardy universe. Um, there's that terrible 
Henry Fonda, Lucille Ball comedy, yours, mine, and ours. I love that. Movie. Movie. I love it. Too. And I and I got the chance to talk to Tim Matheson about oh, cool. it because he, he was the oldest kid. Right. But I love that his best friend is Van Johnson. And I'm like, and I, I remember taking a screen cap and putting it on my Facebook feed. And I'm like, the only time that Steve Merrick from the Kane Mutiny and Mr. Roberts served <laughs> together. Because there really was both of them in uniform. Right. Like, there's Mr. That's Roberts, right. there's Steve Merrick. Right. So did you see, um, it was just on Showtime, and it ended up being William Friedkin's last movie. They did a remake of the Kane Mutiny Court Martial, where it's the play, which is slightly oh, different from the movie. Sure, yeah. And, and Kiefer Sutherland played Captain Queeg. I will and have it, to look for that. It's it's on Paramount Plus if you have Paramount Plus. So. I don't, but you know, I'll add it to the list in one of these days. Yeah. Uh, Mike wants to thank you for your work on the DC Heroes uh, role playing game modules. I remember those well in the late eighties. The Alice of the DC Universe was an amazing aid for my games back then. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was a hellacious job. It was. <laughs> It was, uh, I, I uh, uh, wrote this, the Atlas of the DC Universe, which, was, you know, this is pre-internet. Everything was, you know, I had to go do the research. I spent time in the DC library and Xeroxing, and then I had, you know, a stack like this of, of, of reference. And, uh, yeah, I had to pull that whole thing together. And I, I even had to draw, like, the, the, the roughs for the maps of all the towns and stuff. It was awful job. Uh, I'm, it's it's one of those jobs that's like, well, in retrospect, it's cool, but at the time, no, don't ever do this again. <laughs> well, I, I get it, but I have to say, I, I I never played role playing games. Me neither. But I but but I did appreciate uh, your atlas, and then also um, the Watchmen Bible that they came up with the RPG yeah. games. And it's funny because they did recently, within the last five years, reprint the Watchmen one. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I, I mean, I know from a continuity standpoint, things are so different now. But it would be yeah. great to see uh, that be reprinted. Your your atlas well, be reprinted. Yeah. The, as well. the, it it kind of became the default, um, you know, reference for for the DCU, but it was never intended to be. It was only intended to be for the for the role playing games. But you know, people started using it, and now I take crap. It's like, how could you put Gotham City across the bay from Metropolis? How could they possibly? It's a fucking comic book. Get over it. I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? Uh, <laughs> By all means, man. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's like you know, fine. It, it it you don't have to you don't have to go by those rules. Make up your own because it's well, every amazing. every every leap year, I get giddy because one, one of my birthday. friends. Exactly, I had the old I had the old DC calendar that listed not well. Now they claim April because that's the month of Action Comics one. Yeah. Back in '38, but it's like, no, man, Superman's birthday is February 29th. I'm sorry, it's that's what he knows. And Bridwell said, and I'm sticking with it. No better, uh, no better expert than uh, than Absolutely. Nelly. Absolutely, he was he he was our he he was our internet before there was an internet for superheroes. Yeah. How much also were Zakis too? Because unless he leaned on, yeah. on Nelly, but I know the answer, man. I used to love reading uh, Bob's. Yeah. Uh, yeah little columns and stuff. Bob, Bob was, you know, Bob's job at DC was you know, like in production and stuff. So we didn't bother him. You know, we, we, you, you, you had a question about continuity. You'd pop your head into Nelson. Cause that's, you know, that's what he was there for. Oh, that's funny. Mike remembers that maybe the first day of spring is Robin's birthday. Might be. That, I don't know. that sounds funny. That, yeah. that, that, would, that would make sense. And then he also says the fictional sport teams and working out which divisions they resided in. Must have been tough. The Gotham Knights. I forget what what was Metropolis's uh, baseball team. Oh, I I honestly couldn't tell you. I I have Sorry. You know, <laughs> it, in in real life. I have absolutely no interest in sports. You know, it's like I don't think I've ever watched a complete sporting event in my life. So, what did you um, watch last night? As we're recording the day after after the Super Bowl. What were we watching last night? Oh, we're watching Mr. T. It's a, um, uh, what language? Oh, it's a German series about a, uh, it's kind of like Monk, but uh, a, a little less, uh, you know, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, 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 you know, an OCD detective. 
Oh, okay, yeah, that's great. Because yeah, I assumed it was not about uh, the A teams, Mister T. No, They're no, 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 no. It's uh, German side. There's also been a British version. I think a Swedish version of the character. So, but. have you seen that? There's that documentary about uh, the Raymond. Uh, Everybody loves Raymond. The Ray Romano TV show. I haven't seen and that yet. I want to. It's oh, the great. Raymond? Yes, yes, oh, yes. That I have seen. Yes. Okay, but yes. yeah, that was really interesting watching that granule look of. Uh, of a of a import, you know, and how it's treated in another country and stuff. It was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, humor is is so you know, so like again, I've been watching a lot of a lot of English stuff, and we watch. Uh, there's this uh, British, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's a quiz show, but it's called uh, uh, "Would I Lie to You?" And the premise is two teams of three, you know, demi celebrities, and uh, uh, and the host. And they read off these things, you know, I once uh, rented, uh, you know, I once slept in a shed for six months and, and then the other team has to find out whether it's true or not. Um, and uh, uh, I forgot my point, but it's very funny. <laughs> well, that's another show that perhaps, you know, imports, I like to well, tell right, the truth. Right, the humor. Right, right. It's, well, and, sure. it is, it is very funny. And, um, you know, but, like I don't get about a third of it. Not well, yeah, I, mean, I get the reference, but I just don't see why that would be funny. <laughs> uh, all right, Henry has an essay question, and Henry, perhaps <laughs> you, could, you could narrow this, or Paul himself in his answer can narrow this. But he says, "Paul, what creations were inspired by what stuff?" Oh wow! Oh, um, um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, well, yeah, Harry. Uh, yeah, uh, Arion, uh, uh, Lord of Atlantis, was inspired by Larry Niven's The Magic Goes Away. Um, uh, yeah, I was a big fan of Niven, still am, although I haven't read anything in a long time. But I uh, really loved that book, and I love the concept of, you know, the, the, the magic disappearing in a magically-based world. So um, I still, I mean, I was inspired by that and, uh, you know, did Arion. Um, what That's else? That's a good one. Tachyon, which was uh, which was something that only ran for about not about it ran for seven issues. It was drawn by Aaron Lepresti, and it, originally I had done I, I had pitched it as a uh, a revital uh, bringing back the Will Payton Starman character, but uh, uh, Robinson and 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 Archie Goodwin already had their Starman in development, so uh, I was going to toss it, but the editor. Uh, I was working with said, so let's just change the name. <laughs> and instead of tying it to that Starman character, I uh, 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 tied it to to the fourth world stuff. You know, I, I linked it in with the source and and all that stuff for his powers. Uh, so uh, not exactly an inspiration, but you know, it certainly it certainly drew upon that stuff. And um, what else is it? Oh, checkmate, uh, checkmate. I don't think there was any. You know, I was just doing a a, a, a super secret organization. Um, Shield yeah. was never in your mind in terms of when you created Checkmate. I, you know, I guess. I mean, but yeah, I, I don't think I actually. Maybe I did. I, I don't remember. You know, it it, it 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 sounds like the thing. I'd go well. It'll be like our Shield. You know, so there also was that there was that TV show. I want to say in the it was Sebastian Cabot called Checkmate, and I wondered oh, sure. if see. I wondered if DC had the license for that, and maybe it was still okay. Because no, yeah, I no, wonder. If um, okay. I do have the I do have the two issues of the Dell Con or Gold Key or Dell, but there were two issues of a Checkmate uh, comic uh, with Sebastian Cabot and what's his name? Uh, was it Mike Connors? No, not Mike Connors. Um, Rod Taylor. Oh wow, Rod Taylor, big yeah. obviously. Australian actor that made a lot yeah. of Hollywood yeah. movies. It's interesting yeah. that he was doing TV for that minute. I only recently found out he was Australian. I mean, my whole life he always spoke with an American accent. So then I saw him interviewed. And it's like, what are you putting that on for? Isn't that crazy? No, I yeah. agree. It's like Anthony LaPaglia as well does such yeah. a great yeah. New York accent and stuff. And then you hear, oh hello, and he, you know, he does his he does his Aussie accent. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I just saw, uh, and I really paid attention to it this time. Speaking of Rod Taylor, the train robbers with John Wayne and Ann Margaret from the early oh, 70s. Yeah. Yeah. And a buddy and, a, a, and I were watching it, and he's like, man, 
man, Margaret does not look healthy in this movie. What's the deal? And it literally was the first movie she made after she fell off the stage in Vegas. Oh, okay. And and so she was still kind of frail and still recovering. And apparently I read a great article about it that Wayne was like, all right, like let's let's take it easy on Anne. She's still recovering. Let's take it easy on the little lady. Exactly, man. Yeah, so John Wayne. So and she and she was interviewed and she's like, no, Duke really was kind of like my guardian angel on that movie, I'll making bet. sure they wouldn't ask me to like fall off the saddle or anything rough, you know. <laughs> Too funny, man. Paul, oh, we could wrap up. This was fantastic, and I'm excited yeah, for you. Uh, you know, as always, love talking to you. You know that, and always everybody hates direct creativity. The creators who in the creators who inspired the creators. Who or what inspired you in your development as a comic book creator? And again, let's look at this uh, group of, uh, of wonderful uh, creators that you talk to and creative people. And I think uh, this is going to be a fantastic read. There are two weeks left in the Kickstarter campaign, and I urge people to go and, uh, and check it out. I so, yeah. Oh, that's right, of course, Henry. You're right. Uh, Rod Taylor and Sebastian Cabot, both in the time machine. Uh, 100%. Right. One of my exactly. favorites. See, you know, I can watch. That's a that's a sci-fi fantasy movie I could still watch and enjoy. I don't know There's about you. Some, you know, I, I, I like some of the older stuff. Uh, you know, I, I love the. Uh, you know, I can still watch the old Universal monster stuff. Uh, you, you know, because that. I mean, that's not horror. You know, that's it's. Yeah, you know, it's a it, class by itself. I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are things. You know, the day the Earth stood still. Uh, 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 you know. Uh, what's the thing? The uh, Leslie Nielsen movie. The uh, Forbidden Planet. Absolutely. Forbidden Planet. Yeah. You know that kind of stuff. Sure, I can watch that. That 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 holds up for me. But uh, the newer stuff, I kind of lost interest. You know, I think it it's it's kind of inside baseball for me. I just got like you know you you do this stuff all the time. It's like all right, enough of this. I want to watch something about real people. You know, so. I can appreciate that, man. Absolutely. Well, everybody, check out the Kickstarter campaign for Paul's new book. Also, go to uh, Paul. It's paulcupperberg dot net, net, right? Yes. Yes. And go there and really check out the bookstore because Paul has written some amazing books about how to write comics, but also uh, other other great books and uh, and a lot of good lord that uh, JSA uh, novel that you've got, I hope is still up there for sale. And Ragnarok, yep, that's still still up there and available. Yep. Excellent. I mean, you know, and uh, remind me your your fifties uh, pastiche of uh, the fifties com comic book writing era that was a murder mystery. Oh, uh, the same old story. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, set in the 1950s and, and uh, guest stars Julie Schwartz as, as a supporting character. Uh, and uh, yeah. And, and is, uh, you know. So, yeah, these are, these, are, these are great pieces of fiction and uh, great uh, interview books from uh, and, and how to write comic books from Paul Kupperberg. I'll wait for you at paulkupperberg.net. Check it out. Uh, thanks, man. I, you know, well, uh, whenever you. you got something new, it's a, it's a good excuse to start a new podcast. Regardless, I will see you this summer at uh, Terrificon in Connecticut. Yeah. I'm sure we'll have to, we'll have to arrange some stuff for that. Absolutely, buddy. Well, thank you, thank you, everybody, for watching. Tomorrow night, I'm going to talk a bit with a good friend of mine from my uh, Chicago radio career, my friend Harry Tynowitz, who, ironically, Paul will likely remember this movie. I'm betting he didn't watch it. Mad Magazine's Up the Academy from 1980. Remember that movie? I, I actually did see it. I don't remember it. Uh, well, there were drugs involved. I mean, when they were making it, I don't know about me. But. There would have to be because yes. it is. And it's so sad because, God, so many interesting people. Bernie uh, Bernie Brillstein, exec, yeah. produced the movie. Uh, uh, Tarsus and Pratchett, two great comedy writers of the period. They wrote the script. Robert Downey Sr., uh, Jr.'s right. dad, directed the movie. Rob Liebman is in the movie. Um, Tom Poston is in the movie. Uh, so many great character actors. Barbara Bach is in the movie. Ringo's wife from Spy Who Loved Me and, and Caveman and the like. Uh, yeah. But it just it just didn't work. Did and not uh, work at all. Harry was and one of the kids. The, and this from the man who brought you Putney Swope. So. <laughs> yeah. This is true. Downey Sr., uh, it's, it, I, I think it's interesting to look at because also it was from the raunchy teen comedy period, yeah. but it was kids that were under, yeah. but they were under 18 
So they, it couldn't be a TNA comedy because they were kids. But I, I just I can't wait to talk to Harry about this. In addition to we were both uh, contemporaries working in sports radio in the '90s and 2000s. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to this conversation. That's yeah, tomorrow night. Yeah, so I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, everybody. Until next time, stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. <laughs>